everybody, and thank you for joining us here at the Melbourne Recital Centre Salon for the beginning of part two of the World Temper Clavier as part of the MRC's 48 Ways of Looking at Bach. <laughs> um, we've dug out all the instruments we have available um, here at the bowels of the MRC. So we've got the regular instrument here and we have the, um, the second single manual harpsichord. Um, because as a keyboard player of this period, there is nothing, I suppose, more controversial and more problematic than issues of tuning. Um, without going into too much detail, we'll talk a little bit more about it a bit later tonight. Um, there are always going to be problems when you try tuning an instrument that is static, as far as its tuning system is concerned, with instruments of more flexible nature, like you know, your, your standard violin family and so forth. So most of the 17th, 18th century was um, dominated by a more, uh, to us, old-fashioned and maybe uh, archaic and perhaps even out-of-tune system, which actually for pretty much everybody, and in fact even the French organs right up through to the 19th century, were perfectly happy with this system. However, Bach, of course, from the um, school that he was raised in, which was one of um, looking at mathematics and acoustics and everything uh, that constituted um, this incredibly complicated world of tuning, uh, he was one of these great experimenters, and we believe that uh, he left a rather cryptic message which tells you actually how to tune your, tune your harpsichord so that you can play in all available keys, of which there are, well, 24. See, see my, all the majors and minors. So what I want to do here, um, I'm doing C, everything from C major up to D sharp minor. So we're only working in a very small area. Uh, but what I want to try and do here is contrast both the prelude and fugue as it was um, delivered by Johann Sebastian, looking at the antecedents of the prelude and fugue combination, but also looking at the way that um, previous musicians had dealt with this issue of tuning. Um, because I've intentionally chosen a lot of pieces that are in C, D, and in one instance, G, which is way out. Um, but the idea being to show how you can actually exploit the different tuning systems that they had available at that time. So this one here is tuned to quarter, comma, mean tone, which was the, as I said, the most sort of standard system up till about 1700 and was still being used in France, actually, in the 19th century. And this is tuned by the wonderful Alice McAllister, who actually done both instruments. Uh, and he's done this one using one of these variants on the, um, well, one of the interpretations of the Bach tuning system. So having given us D major, let's move into something far more exciting and fruity, and let's try out what C sharp major sounds like. Mm. Which is basically for, um, you know, the music pedagogues out there, you can't have any more sharps in your key signature. <coughs>
So if we still have D major in our heads from before that, I like the idea of even though C sharp major is technically a semitone lower, it sounds a lot higher. Um, so let's go now to C major, and we're going to go right back to the uh, late 16th century. Um, Peter Phillips, who was about uh, half a generation older than William Byrd, uh, he was one of the early great keyboard masters of um, the English keyboard school. Uh, I just discovered today that he wrote this Pavan um, and Galliard um, Dolorosa when he was uh, imprisoned in The Hague. Now, as it happens, I also spent four years living in The Hague. <laughs> Enough said, apparently. So um, the Dolorosa idea is, of course, a very common theme in 16th century and early 17th century England. And then later, of course, in 17th century Europe, everybody was suffering from a bout of melancholy. Uh, in particular, it hit the English, I think, earlier because of the uh, religious war and problems that were going on. Um, but certainly melancholy was a very um, common problem that most people found themselves afflicted with. Um, I'm at the moment um, sort of picking little passages out from the wonderful book by Robert Burton called The Anatomy of Melancholy. Now this is about this large, it's about 1,200 pages long, and it is a sort of pre-scientific, scientific exploration on um, what made melancholy, because I'll stop, prom I promise, I promise I'll stop talking. Um, but melancholy was one of these um, sort of medical conditions because melancholy came from, was the black bile that was inside your um, digestive system that made you feel melancholy. But melancholy, of course, is an artistic uh, expression as well. So it sort of existed in both the metaphysical world and the physical world. So without further ado, <clears throat> in the meantime,
string break earlier, so just a quick. So what is a prelude? I have been spending the last three years of my life trying to um, research what a prelude is, um, specifically in relation to Louis Couperin, who we will come to a little bit later. Uh, but most of the 17th, 16th, 18th centuries were all um, quite heavily influenced by the practice of rhetoric. Um, you know, the boring thing that we all have to do in school where we're taught to write a speech that has a beginning and a middle and an argument and this and that, and no one really, really is very interested in that. Well, that turned out to be a fairly important um, part of life in the 17th century. So a prelude in a rhetorical function is effectively the first thing that you would say um, you know, at a presentation or a speech or any, any sort of you know, spoken argument. And the idea of it being is to put your audience at ease and to make them feel comfortable and to make them feel like they're ready to start listening to something that's going to be informative, that will educate them and that they're going to enjoy listening to. So, of course, um, the great example, always the first thing you do is, you know, you walk and say, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the theatre. You know, that's the most common way of running it. And Aristotle would have said, if you had a theatre back then, he would have said we would say, you know, well, he did have a theatre, but they called it something else. Um, but that was exactly the whole idea, was to make someone feel, you know, comfortable and, and ready, to, ready to listen to someone do a two-hour sermon. So... For Bach, I think the most compact way of doing this is um, you know, to have your prelude, which effectively is establishing the key, but a lot of people overlook the idea that it should make someone also feel you know, comfortable. So it's meant to be something, I think, that is you know, pleasant to listen to and makes you go, oh, that's nice, I can't wait to hear what happens next. Michelangelo Rossi, of course, was one of these Italian folks who really liked the idea of exploiting what you can do when you try and capture someone's attention. Um, he was, um, I suppose, the uh, successor to Frescobaldi in Italy. Uh, and his most famous of his um, book of toccatas is the seventh toccata that I'm going to move on to now, uh, because this really exploits the tuning system of um, quarter comma mean tone. Um, which I should probably go into some detail about a bit later, but I won't do it now because I've already talked about preludes. Um, but nonetheless, he uses the chromatics. Um, you know, Peter Phillips had some ideas of it. it makes you go, ooh, that's interesting. But the, um, the toccata that he does is, um, I think, closes in a manner that's, well, I wouldn't say it's in a very manneristic style. And it, um, I think, sort of tips the balance a little bit in the way of making feel a bit giddy. <laughs>
D minor, and I'm about to do C major for Bach. So this is about, I think, as um, you know, key-wise, as simple as you can get for him. And as is, I think, always the the instance with this sort of um, music. It's amazing just how much um, emotional drama, you know, can be drawn even from the most simplest of um, of, of keys. Well, simple of keys. <coughs>
be impossible to do, I think, a presentation of um, antecedents to Bach's music without doing something by Buxtehude. And I think every time that I've done something by Buxtehude or in Latitude 37 have done something by Buxtehude, we have to tell the story about how um, the young Johann Sebastian uh, walked all the way from his hometown in Thuringia right up north to Lübeck, um, getting in a spot of trouble along the way because he asked for leave for about two weeks and of course he ended up spending about two months away. Um, but he spent that time of course studying with the great master who was um, you know, reputed to be the best organist I think in Germany at the time and one of the great teachers. Um, Buxtehude was also, I suppose, one of the main exponents in, this, uh, in, in the musical manner called the Stilus Fantasticus, which was um, very popular in Germany, well, it originated in Germany. And that, I suppose, is the German take on the sort of Italian uh, bravura that we would have heard um, in the Rossi Toccata. So it was um, this element of, you know, moving, moving one's listener, um, causing them to feel all types of uncertainty, um, Ton Koopman, my teacher, when I first um, studied um, a piece of books to her to buy, actually it was this piece, uh, he said to me, you have to imagine that you're playing in a church at the end of the service and, you know, everyone's falling asleep and um, you just, and you have to make, what was that? And then you do something else, it's like, well, what did I just hear? Now I'm just confused. So that's, <laughs> that's effectively still as fantastic as, um, as described by Ton Koopman. <laughs> from the sort of middle area of the C's and the E majors and all that, and we're going right through to G. I've chosen to do this on the mean tone harpsichord, especially as a way of showing how um, even the manner of composing at this time was really starting to push this tuning system to its limits, um, and that ultimately they had to find it a compromise in another way. <laughs>
coming to the most, or to the more profound section. Um, so this is Bach in C sharp minor and uh, D sharp minor. I think there must be something about C sharp minor which speaks to um, the compositional mind. You know, I mean, there's the um, there's a gravitas of of this. Uh, upcoming Prelude and Fugue, but you know, you think, say, of the Moonlight Sonata, or you think of the Fantasy Impromptu of Chopin, uh, or even the opening of Mahler Five. Um, there's there's something about I don't know whether it's because for a long time it was a key signature that you just simply couldn't play in. Um, I'll just give you a clue. Here you go. <coughs> you know, and that's okay, but the dominant. You know, forget it. It's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> So I think as soon as we started to get this, you know, development of um, the tuning system that gave keys like C sharp minor the possibility to exist, um, it really seems to have spoken to, as I said, to the to the creative mind. Uh, and D sharp minor. When I said earlier that C sharp minor is the worst key of all, I was just hiding the fact that actually D sharp minor is even worse, because not only do you have all the sharps, but you also get up to four double sharps, which is just ridiculous. Um, so it's, but the, the fugue is just absolutely wonderful. So. <clears throat>
after that, who doesn't want a bit of C major? <laughs> I know I do. Um, so I'm going to finish with Louis Couperin, who was the uncle of Francois Couperin Le Grand, uh, Le Grand and the, um, effectively the one I've spent the last three years of my life devoting my energies to the unmeasured privilege of Louis Couperin. So I won't talk too much about him, but he is the founder of the Couperin family in Paris, effectively. They came from out in the countryside. Uh, and he studied with, um, well, actually, he didn't study. I correct myself. He possibly studied with Jacques Champignon, Champignon de Chavonnier. Um, but Couperin um, brought us a, I suppose, an Italian influence to the French harpsichord style um, in the middle of the 17th century. So I'm beginning with a prelude, of course, <laughs> finishing with a piece which goes with a prelude. In this instance, it's the Grand Passacai, um, which is just a really fantastic piece. Uh, in C major, of course, because, you know, um, with all the keys in the world, we don't necessarily have to go beyond, beyond the most simple. <laughs>
very much. Thank you. Beautiful playing. <laughs> My name is Robert Murray. I'm the Director of Marketing and Customer Relations here at Melbourne Recital Centre. Um, and it's my very great pleasure to spend a few minutes talking with you and Donald uh, about um, Bach, harpsichords, <laughs> temperament. There's a whole world of, uh, we could talk for hours potentially about any number of these things. Um, I particularly loved how we, uh, we ended in C major as well, sort of coming full circle again back to that <laughs> fundamental key. And um, I think it was Schoenberg who said that there was plenty of music Still Let it be done see. <laughs> yeah, but he hadn't heard that Rossi piece because um, that would, <laughs> that would so certainly uh, curl his hair. Um, so tell me a little bit about your relationship with J.S. Bach. What's, what's the relationship Ooh. that early musicians or any musician has with a composer who's been dead for... 350 years. years. Yeah. It's a funny one, isn't it? Because, um, you know, I think um, it's impossible to you know, make any reference, I think, to any musical development in the Western world after his time without paying some, you know, influence or reference to, to Bach. And I mean, you know, jazz musicians just absolutely worship him and I just go, wow, that's really incredible. I think we classical musicians need to study our Bach up a lot more because, you know, these guys are really, you know, I think, I think the, um, I think the, the, the successes of the early music movement lie in the hands of the jazz musicians, which I'm really worried about saying because, but I think they really, um, it, it, it really is, it's, it's, it's hard to put him on a pedestal because I, Bach, of course, is one of the most humble people you would ever meet. Of course, he was very, um, you know, he was no, um, he didn't suffer fools. He really had no <coughs> time for anybody who you know, wasn't prepared to, you know, commit 100%. Um, but at the same time, I think he would have been somewhat um, surprised and perhaps a little annoyed at the way that we, um, you know, worship him the way that we do. But it's impossible not to because every, um, every note, of course, is in the right place. And, you know, you can add a couple more notes if you want and you can remove a couple if you want and yet it still just makes so much sense. Mm. <laughs> I mean, he had... It's almost like he did have one eye on eternity and posterity when he wrote some of his works, but there was a huge amount of his output that he just churned through and probably mm. never would be surprised that we would be listening to it today. But, yeah, yeah. But I think the 48 perhaps well, were, were an example of the works that he really treasured in his own... I mean, I think it's, it's an interesting, I think, period too. I was just talking with Andrew Bernard about this. You know, Germany at this time was... Um, the education system that Bach went through was um, so complete and their way of thinking about music um, was still tied to this old medieval idea of the seven liberal arts where music was considered as much a science as it was an art form. In fact, I think... Um, that transition of considering music as a as an art really hadn't taken place, I think, at that point. So it's been on my mind while we've been looking at while I've been looking at these fugues in particular. I think it's a just digressing a little bit, but I think it's a funny. The strangest thing about fugues is that you know you can study them as much as you can, and there's so much detail, and yet when you hear it, it's all just transient, and it all goes through over in an instant. And there's this um, dichotomy between you know music as an oral art and as a studied one which is written down of course it exists in two different mediums here um, and you know Bach's education of thinking about you know music as a form of mathematics it's made me wonder and this is just a silly little idea that I've been pondering about whether he might have had some form of synesthesia or something but I really wonder about the idea of listening to the fugues and thinking of them as kind of like, you know, numeric mathematical processes happening as well as just musical ideas that are unfolding. Um, there's this tale about, um, from I think Carl Philipp Emanuel, who said that, you know, Bach could be listening to um, someone improvising a fugue and he'd be able to, you know, mutter to his children, oh, you can do, you know, this type of inversion of the fugue or you can do this type of retrograde. Uh, and I think that says that he's not thinking about it from notes. He's not going, okay, G sharp to B flat. Which is, 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 uh, there's really something more numeric happening here. Um, and I don't know if necessarily that's um, his own way of thinking about it or if it was just one part of this larger um, system that he was brought up in. I'm inclined to think the latter. Um, so, of course, what that means is that we're now looking at Bach in two dimensions. We're thinking about it from being, you know, as, as a musical form, which, of course, is the most complete and most wonderful form you'll find, but also when it's representing another 
um, form of knowledge in that respect, in this, in this respect, mathematics and numbers. I think it just, it, 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 the more, you know, this is a problem. The more you look into Bach, the more you get back from it, and then the more questions you have, and the more he seems to be answering everything that you've had, you kind of go, oh, well, that makes sense. Oh, well, what about this question? Ah, oh, he's covered that already as well. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, the, um, the world and the clavier as a, you know, tuning system, of course, is all mathematics and acoustics, you know. Um, again, I should be bringing up Andrew, because we were just talking about this just 10 minutes before, um, before, before I came out. Um, you know, the, it's an ongoing problem between having something that's in tune and having something that is um, mathematically pure. They just don't happen. I'd love to be able to demonstrate it with a third harpsichord, but sadly we don't have enough space for that, but nor the time. Yeah, <laughs> for, 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 for future investigation. Yeah. I guess in a si as a sidebar too, uh, um, uh, an excellent book on the subject of Bach and maths and philosophy and everything else is... Um, uh, Douglas Hofstadter's Gödel Escher Bach, um, which I commend to anyone who's interested in this uh, dizzying world of uh, Bach's imagination. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about temperament and mathematics. Um, you you created two very different sounding instruments here. Um, the mean tone tuned instrument, um, just. In a nutshell, mm, what is it? <laughs> and what does that mean? Right, so let's go. I'll try and be as quick as I can. I did a radio interview with Latitude once, and I ran us um, at our concert run over time, and they had to cut the last piece out because of this exactly this specific thing. So, tuning the smallest interval that you have, or well, the purest interval you have beyond the octave, is the fifth. So, if you tune from C and you do right through a series of fifths, you will end up at the other end with a B sharp, which is actually higher than the C that you started with. So. Um, in order to do that, you can do, um, you can subtract a little bit from the fifth at the very end, or you can subtract from a certain amount. Now, equal temperament is effectively a sort of 12th comma mean tone where there's a little bit of this hangover, the so-called Pythagorean comma. So each, every fifth is just narrowed a little bit. But the problem with narrowing fifths, as much as you have nice fifths, is that you have stupidly wide thirds. So you have, you know, one element being a decent fifth but a horrible third. Mean tone takes another approach that tries to tune its thirds pure, but if you tune thirds pure, then you have fifths that are really narrow. So it goes, um, it's this sort of compromise. So you, you can hide the pure, f the narrow fifth with the pure third in the same way as you can sort of hide the wide third with the, um, with the slightly less pure fifth. Um, but mean tone is effectively is, um, you know, it means that you have a few keys that are very, very nice in tune because they have a pure third. But there are also a whole lot of keys that are just not worth going here, like you know D sharp minor and C sharp major and everything that Bach was able to do. But the argument had constantly been toyed around with the idea of are there other areas that we can you know subtract fifths to make. Um, but of course you always get you end up having religious and semantic problems with the idea of you know tempering with nature, which effectively is what it comes down to. Um, but of course Bach, being the scientist and experimentalist as he was, um, was looking at this idea of um, you know, having an instrument that was another compromise, as you will, to the harmonics and the physics of, of acoustics. And um, it's only recently, you know, in the last 15 or so years, there's this theory that is very, very, you know, that's so amazing, um, that in the little doodle that Bach put on the cover of the Well-Tempered Clavier, someone, um, who was it, Bradley Lehman, to begin with, looked at it and went, that's a tuning system. And this is totally fitting in with 17th century, 18th century Germany with this whole idea of emblems and it's, it's as I was saying, Guillaume St. Andrew, it's a sort of prototype meme culture where you have a little reference to something and it um, doesn't matter what the image is, but it means sort of something else and it's a representative of, of, of another thing. And in fact, his little doodle, it turns out, was him telling how you actually narrow the fifths. Now, the version that Alice has used has been a revised version that has been done by, what's his name? some other musicologist slash acoustician guy. Um, and it's a very, very convincing um, method which makes a lot of sense of what are effectively a series of enigmatic doodles. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it would, well, <laughs> what, what is there to say after that except that it sounds completely like something Bach would do because um, if, you've, if you've ever seen that very famous portrait of um, Bach with holding a little piece of sheet yeah, music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually, that sheet music turned up uh, in the 70s and turned out to be a set of um, puzzle canons mm. um, that people have realized. So he'll write a little Latin motto and then if you can interpret it correctly, you get a whole piece of music. So <laughs> it's just it's, amazing. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous how amazing it is. Yeah, stunning <laughs> stuff. Um, 
just check the time. We're almost out of time. What should people listen to next if they want to continue their journey into Whoa. this world? We're, we're, more, we're just over halfway through the, uh, the two books of Preludes and Fugues, but... That's a very, very good question, and you've floored me with that <laughs> one. I mean, let's be honest, you can't go past, you can't go past Bach with more Bach. Um, and then more Bach is always good with more Bach, but then sometimes, <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, um, it's, there's, there, w there, one can also follow his, his own ancestry. You know, Bach himself, of course, collated um, a lot of the, the, the so-called, um, you know, old Bach um, library. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Which is the compilation of all the, all the music that was put together by the previous Bach. Because Bach, yeah, Johann Sebastian, of course, wasn't the first. He was, you know, the tenth in a dynasty that went back to, you know, about the 16th century. Um, and a lot of his uncles, um, in particular, put together some absolutely wonderful um, vocal music. Um, and that really, I think, shows, and Buxtehude as well, I mean, that really shows the influences in the world that he was, that he was dealing with. Um, but I suppose, you know, I want to say Copernicus also might feature somehow in there as well. <laughs> yeah. Do some reading, yeah. do some drawing, um, listen to some more of that beautiful Couperin, which is almost like jazz in itself, mm. just to bring it full circle. Mm -hmm. um, but um, explore, that's the spirit of the thing. Mm. Thank you very much for listening and thank you very much for coming um, and um, supporting Melbourne Recital Centre. We really appreciate it. And I hope you'll join us for more Bach. We've got... Book two, part two, in a few weeks. Um, and so much more besides. There's always Bach at Melbourne Recital Centre. It's almost <laughs> as if our programmer is some kind of early musician or something like that. Um, we're very lucky. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.